time in this webinar with lots to get through. So uh, let's get straight into it. Uh, I'm going to give you a few brief points uh, before I hand you over to my colleague Sophie Van Hazen for the introduction. Uh, first to introduce myself, uh, I'm Imer Grork. I'm Advocacy and Communication Officer with ICMC's MAID, uh, Migration and Development Civil Society Network, uh, based here in uh, very cold Brussels today. Uh, I'd like to really welcome all of you to this MAID webinar um, on civil society advocacy towards the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration. Uh, I'll just take you through some technical points and I'll give you a bit of a sense of what this webinar will entail before we uh, get into the meat of the webinar. So first I'd really um, like to ask you all to keep your, mo uh, your microphones muted and we will be uh, proactively muting your microphones uh, while others are speaking just so as to prevent background noise. Um, and if you would like to speak when the floor is open, um, you can unmute uh, by clicking the microphone icon that appears beside your name uh, in the participant or the attendees list. Um, also feel really free uh, to use the chat box for any comments or questions you have. I see some of you are already using it to, um, to greet others on the call. Um, and we will open the floor for questions during the, the webinar, but um, just note that you can write in the chat box at any time, so even when the presenters are speaking, and we'll try our best to either answer those questions um, and comments directly in the chat box, um, or if need be, we'll direct them to the presenter that they're directed to. Um, you'll see in the agenda um, that was sent with your invitation, um, uh, sorry, you'll see in the invitation that we sent you um, the agenda, um, which uh, is divided into two sections. Uh, so the first is um, mainly on process and on what um, civil society has been doing this past year uh, towards the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration at a um, global and regional level. Um, and the second section is uh, more on what we can do next and, and how we can do it and how we can do it together. Um, we will open the floor for questions and comments after each of these two sections, so there will be two opportunities for you to give inputs um, and ask any questions you have, um, aside from the chat box, which you can use at any time. Um, so our presenters um, in each of these sections, um, uh, allow me to introduce you to all three of them who are on the call already. Uh, so the first is our own Sophie Van Hazen, um, she's the MAID program coordinator here. Uh, Colin Raja, um, who is the Civil Society Liaison Officer um, with uh, IOM, the International Organization for Migration, uh, and Vismas, uh, who acted as Civil Society Chair um, at the Global Forum on Migration and Development Civil Society Days uh, in Berlin earlier this year. So thank you very much to all three of you for agreeing to uh, present today. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot to discuss uh, and not much time to discuss it. So um, I'll ask the presenters to keep their interventions brief. And I would ask you participants also to keep your own points brief um, when we open the floors, just to allow as many as possible to speak and to make sure that we get through everything on the agenda. Um, and so that's it from me. I'm going to hand you over to uh, Sophie now um, to bring you through the introduction. And um, uh, yeah, I really hope you enjoy the, the webinar. Hi everyone, um, great, my sound settings are working. Um, so thanks, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's really nice to see such a large and diverse list of participants and it's interesting to see that some of you we, we know and some of you um, we see for the first time. So, so welcome. Um, thank you so much, Imer, for um, the introduction to the call and the agenda. Uh, we only have an hour and a half, so we'll have to be relatively um, quick in our presentation. So please bear with us um, in that. Mm, so since we have such a diverse group of organizations um, with a number of you um, perhaps not very uh, updated on the Global Compact process, let me just give you a few words of background and context on this Global Compact on safe, orderly and regular migration um, before we go into uh, civil society organizing updates and work towards um, the negotiations uh, next year. Um, so as many of you know, 
2015 and 2016 have been really um, very interesting years showing an increased attention and commitment from states uh, and from the United Nations to address challenges and opportunities um, regarding human mobility. And we already saw that in Agenda 2030 um, with very specific language on, on migrants um, and migration in there, especially in the preamble actually. Um, and then the New York Declaration that was signed by, by UN member states last year in September um, actually brought forward um, some of that language um, in the Agenda 2030, uh, specifically um, looking at the development of two global compacts, um, two global compacts that are to be adopted uh, by UN member states uh, by the end of 2018. So in the New York Declaration, states committed to these two processes, um, one on global compact on refugees and one um, global compact on safe, orderly and regular migration. Uh, the difference between these two uh, global compacts um, is that they would be developed um, through a different kind of facilitation process, whereas UNHCR would be taking or is taking the lead um, in the de development of the global compact on refugees and the global compact on uh, migration is being led by two by two states uh, the two co-facilitators uh, namely the mexican and the swiss government and they do that of course um, in very close uh, working relationships with um, the Special Rapporteur on International Migration, Ms. Louise Arbor, the Office um, of the President of the General Assembly, um, and IOM. So the development of this compact on um, migration um, is kind of divided in three different phases. And we currently find ourselves at the end uh, of the first phase going into the second phase. So basically in this two years uh, that states have to develop this global compact on migration, um, they've pointed out three, three different steps. Uh, the first one would be the consultation phase, um, which took place this year and kind of um, is, is encompassing a number of different consultations. Um, we have had six thematic consultations um, on very specific um, issues that were stipulated in the New York Declaration. Um, we have had two multi-stakeholder consultations, um, and then there have been a number of regional um, consultations that have been moved forward by the regional economic commissions of the United Nations. Um, we've also had a number of national consultations um, where member states or civil society have taken the lead in, in organizing these. Um, so civil society in this process has been involved, but it hasn't been very structural. Um, most of the participation in the thematic and the multi-stakeholder um, um, consultations have been, has been done by a UN-led uh, process and, an, and a steering committee uh, that decided upon who would speak and who would participate. Um, but in, in a general sense, um, civil society involvement wasn't that um, that streamlined across all of the different moments in this in this consultation phase. Um, but of course, civil society very much self-organized um, in this consultation um, process, and we'll go um, into that a little bit further in the agenda. So this consultation phase is coming to an end um, right now, and we're moving into the stock taking phase. The stock taking phase um, is kind of um, is marked by the UN um, stock taking conference, which is taking place uh, from the 4th um, to the 6th of December in Puerto Vallarta, um, where basically uh, the two co-facilitators, so Mexico and Switzerland, will be looking at um, this entire year of consultations, um, both at the regional level at the thematic level um, as well. So the idea of these three days of stock taking would be to um, to kind of look what has happened in the in the in this year. Um, Colin Raja will actually take you through that process a little bit further down the agenda. Um, the last step um, of the process to develop the global compact is a negotiation phase, will, which will start um, next year, early next year uh, in February, once the co-facilitators launch their zero draft uh, for the global compact. Um, so this being said, we don't really know yet what the global compact will look like. Um, we hear from UN agencies, we hear from states uh, that there is kind of an increased 
focus or emphasis on uh, principled pragmatism, on uh, the willingness of having some kind of a graduated timeline um, of um, an accountability system in there. But in terms of the exact content, uh, it is it's still hard to, to really know uh, where these governments are. Um, but if you would like to get a sense of um, different government statements, you can also you can always consult um, the website refugeesmigrants.org, where you can find all of the statements um, in the different consultation processes, but also um, towards the report that um, the Special Rapporteur on International Migration, Ms. Arbor, is currently preparing for the process. Um, so if you want to find out uh, what your government, for example, has, um, has drafted, you can, you can find all of the statements there. Um, so yeah, I think I'll end there with the general introduction. And I, I think we can take it further from the, from the questions that you might have on that after this first agenda item. Great, thank you. Thanks, Sophie, for that intro. Um, I'll just remind all of you that if you have any questions, if anything is not clear, really feel free to uh, write in the comment box um, or keep anything really bursting out of you for the, um, the open floor, which we'll have after this first section. So um, this first section um, is on updates um, at regional and global level. Uh, first, maybe I'll ask um, Colin Raja, the first speaker, to um, introduce a bit about the regional processes that have been taking place uh, all throughout uh, 2017. So, Colin, uh, happy birthday, and also if you'd like to take it away on the regional processes. Thank you very much, Ima, um, and thank you, Sophie, for the excellent introduction. Um, you know, as Sophie mentioned, one of the challenges that we noticed in the consultation phase right from the get-go uh, are twofold. Uh, but before I'm even mentioning the challenges, I want to uh, proceed that with by saying that in the modalities resolution 71280, it was really clear, Article 7 in particular, that this process towards the global compact, both this year as well as through next year, um, while it, it is an intergovernmental process, it is not only an intergovernmental process. Uh, and there are specific roles and specific spaces for stakeholders for, to make contributions and be part of the process as well. Article 7 in particular talks about that in terms of how uh, relevant stakeholders at all through the preparatory processes and as well as the international conference next year um, also um, can contribute uh, by sharing best practices, concrete policies, and convening multi-stakeholder consultations and participation in various kinds of platforms, including regional platforms. One of the challenges when we looked at the modalities for the consultation phase uh, is that we, we recognized, well, there were really robust um, thematic sessions, six thematic sessions, two days each, uh, regional economic commissions, one concluding today, the ASCAP, the final one concluding today, uh, four regional economic commission sessions and consultations. The specific spaces for civil society and other stakeholders uh, in terms of official processes and hearings and consultations were only dedicated into two days uh, uh, for multi-stakeholder hearings. So there will be other half-day sessions starting from December onwards, but in the consultation phase, there was one day for the stakeholder hearings in July in uh, New York, and then the other one about a month ago in Geneva. Uh, so only two days dedicated to an entire consultation phase for this, and we recognize that uh, post challenges. One, to adequately really capture all the significant inputs and diversity of voices in civil society, but also in particular to really engage um, organizations and civil society groups, uh, migrants, diaspora in particular, in practicing at national, regional levels uh, and working at that levels and finding it, as usual, very hard to engage and access uh, New York and Geneva convenings. So we recognize it was really important to try to um, organize something that would be able to capture a lot of that and be able to engage them as much as possible. So we proposed to organize six and then eventually seven regional consultations um, that were also widely uh, accepted and, and recognized by uh, different bodies, including 
the office of the special representative, the secretary general. Um, I'm just uh, sharing on the chat box um, the link on the SRSG's website, the, the official website that Elena uh, shared earlier. Within that um, that website, there is a web page dedicated to these regional civil society consultations. So from August and just until last week, uh, we had a series of these seven consultations. The first in Asia, uh, and then followed by the Middle East and North Africa MENA region, then Africa, US and Canada, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean, and as I mentioned last week, uh, a special uh, consultation for the Pacific region. And these regional consultations were organized entirely by civil society networks and working groups and groups really working in those regions specifically, uh, actively already doing um, work that are region specific advocacy within regional bodies and, and national governments at that level. Uh, and many groups engage on the ground. I'd say about um, 70 to 80 percent of these well, organizations participating in these uh, had heard very little about the Global Compact and very um, had didn't have an opportunity to engage around the Global Compact before those regional civil society consultations. Um, further to mention that uh, each of these consultations, uh, we've had participate, participants from about um, ranging from about 40 to about 70 in each consultation. Uh, while well, some, you know, covered broad uh, areas, uh, we at this moment are calculating somewhere in the region of about 120 countries being represented and engaged uh, through civil society uh, in all of these regional consultations. Um, so very, very engaged and again, very much driven by uh, the regional bodies and regional civil society networks. And final thing to say that the, the outcomes of these in which we'll be sharing uh, in Puerto Vallarta uh, in summary reports um, really range from uh, things that were very broad looking at, for example, the human rights of migrants within the global complex specific issues around um, trafficking, around detentions, around uh, returns to very, very specific regional issues. And I think one of the values of having uh, regional consultations is that we could really dive deep into looking at some of the very nuanced uh, specificities within migration corridors in specific region, uh, the realities of, um, of conflict, of poverty, climate and many other issues that are very region specific. Uh, we also had an opportunity and um, participants in this consultation had the opportunity to look at uh, regional bodies and, and national bodies that were operating that could be leveraged and could be uh, advocated with in terms of engaging the global compact, but also in the implementation stage. And, and I want to close by saying something really important about the implementation side of this. The, one of the things we really try to do in the regional consultations is not just uh, one, of course, very much debriefing, briefing on, on the global compact itself, and secondly, really building up uh, some strong inputs and recommendations on the global compact from a national regional perspective. But really, and thirdly, we tried as much as possible to try and engage with various kinds of government bodies in some cases, national governments participated in the opening, closing, were given um, trust outcomes and, and engaged with directly. In other cases, um, we had regional bodies in Europe, for example, we had the EU present, uh, where again, a dialogue ensued uh, regarding the outcomes of the consultation. Uh, in some, in, in at least uh, three or four of these regional consultations, we also engaged the regional economic commissions. Um, we had representatives from the regional economic commissions come and both present as well as engage in a discussion about the global compact. And then vice versa, we had uh, representatives from these regional society consultations report on the outcomes of our consultations to the regional economic commission's governmental consultations, like what just happened in ASCAP this week uh, and about two weeks ago in the Economic Commission of Africa. Um, well, we had delegations uh, from 
how is this civil society consultations report back? And and I think this is particularly important uh, in the implementation uh, phase. If we begin this cooperation and this uh, dialogue with um, states at the regional level and at the national level, when the rubber uh, meets the road, as we say, you know, when the compact has been said and done and signed, um, what happens to it really, really makes really matters only in terms of how it's implemented. And I really believe this will be a very living document. It's not a convention. Uh, it's a living document. And the, the regional aspect of it, the, the application of that, in many cases, the extension of it, uh, broadening it, um, making it even more concrete, um, I think it's going to happen at the regional level in terms of implementation. And that's why we really thought it was important to have these um, uh, these opportunities uh, from the start. So I'll pause there and, and take any questions later on. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Colin. Um, we will take all uh, the qu all of your questions and comments uh, relating to this update, update updates section uh, at the end. So I'll hand you right over to Sophie um, Van Hazen, um, who will ask to just give you a very quick overview of the uh, global uh, movements uh, focusing on the, the Global Compact for Migration. So Sophie, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Imer. Um, yeah, and of course, I want to justice to all of the different global processes that, that have been investing um, in, in organizing themselves towards um, this global compact. But I just want to highlight maybe a few that are particular in terms of the thematic focus or in terms of their kind of wide reach um, of civil society actors worldwide. So um, why don't I, st I change, I um, start with um, the Global Forum on Migration and Development and the Civil Society Days, um, because both in 2016 and in 2017, uh, the two global fora took place at a really key moment uh, when you look at the timeline of the global compact development as well. So the first one in Bangladesh in 2016 took place just two months after the adoption of the of the New York Declaration. So for civil society, that was a key global moment uh, to discuss uh, the global compact. And actually the entire structure of the forum of the civil society days at least were um, really tied to the New York Declaration um, in itself. But then uh, with the global forum civil society days in Berlin, um, we really made sure that there was a, a very clear link in all of the working sessions uh, that civil society gathered on um, and discussed uh, in the civil society days uh, to really tie them straight into the New York Declaration and to the development of this global compact by really looking at what should civil societies um, bare minimum be uh, that we want to see in this global compact. What are our common messages? Uh, what practices do there exist? Um, so from these two global fora, we have a wealth of civil society positioning um, information on practices, information on governments and where governments stand on certain issues. Um, so I think the two um, global fora were really key moments uh, at the global level to think and strategize about the global compact. Um, maybe just a few numbers in total, there were um, over 700 organizations um, in, two, um, in the two fora um, from about 70 countries um, with almost 100 hours of discussion on some of these, um, these key issues in the global compact. So as a result from the GFMD Society Days in 2017, we've drafted a list of recommendations and detailed notes um, going straight into the global compact process. Um, so that is one. A, a second one that, that I should mention is the Child Rights Initiative. Um, this is an initiative that is kind of steered or comprised of 29 organizations. And interestingly, it's not only a civil society, um, civil society movement. It is civil society led, but in, it includes four UN agencies. So it's really a multi-stakeholder process that tries to look or that looks at um, child rights into or across both global compacts. So this is a really interesting kind of working, working formula. Um, and what they have done, they've gathered in June in Berlin um, in a global conference that gathered um, about 300 organizations. And the outcome document of that conference has really become a very um, 
detailed and very specific um, advocacy document uh, on child rights in both compacts. Um, so we can also share the link uh, to those papers in the chat box. Um, there's also a summary because the, the document is pretty extensive because um, what the initiative has tried to do is really build in a timeline and measurable indicators in it. So when we talk about implementation, this is really one of the kind of tools that we, we could be looking at um, how do we, in, in terms of how do we want the global compact to look like. Um, and then maybe lastly, um, and it also links to the next uh, speaker, um, is the work of the Action Committee. And the Action Committee is um, a group of 22 organizations that actually came together for collective action towards the high-level summit last year and towards the, towards the adoption of the, of the New York Declaration. Uh, and it includes both um, refugee-oriented organizations and migrant-focused or, uh, organizations. And so the group that works on migration specifically um, started working on a draft um, advocacy document, um, which is now no longer draft, but in final version, which we've shared with you um, together with this, uh, with these call-in details, which is called the 10 Acts uh, for a Global Compact. Um, so this is also an example of kind of global collective action um, moving forward as we speak, um, but we um, will give you more information about that. Thanks so much, Sophie. Um, without further ado, and with that great introduction, I might hand you right over to uh, the great Wies Mas. Thanks, Wies. Thank you, Emer. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Colin. It's great to see so many old friends, but also new names uh, on this webinar. And um, yes, I can give you a very brief background into this 10 Acts uh, document, why it was put together and what it aims to do. But I'll try to be very brief because I, because I kind of hope that the document um, speaks for itself and that you had a chance to read it and maybe we can take some questions and answers on it. So just as a little bit of background on this 10 Acts document, as Sophie already um, mentioned, there was this big civil society gathering uh, in Berlin in July um, where there was a lot of um, energy and questions and, um, and attention for what can we do collectively globally as civil society to put forward our vision on what we think a global compact should be and what it should do. So we tried to put together a document that puts forward a unified vision of what a lot of groups within civil society think a global compact can be. And I'm saying a unified vision because obviously it's it's not the only one, it's, it's definitely not the last one, at least that's what we hope, but it's an attempt to, to bring together a lot of the different uh, consultations that have been going on over the last years, but also to bring together a lot of work that we've all been doing over the past years. So as a starting point for this 10 Act document, we really looked at what have we already been putting forward to governments that many of us of our organizations have signed on to that we think is a good starting point. Um, so there were several documents that we put forward last year during the summit for refugees and migrants. Um, but also in earlier years, we produced a five-year five year eight point plan and a couple of other documents. And we triangulated that with what have governments already committed to in the Sustainable Development Goals or in the New York Declaration last year? And how can we draw out these com commitments with some specific goals and actions and targets and timelines? Um, because if there's one thing that we that we analyze, that, that is the problem. Um, no, it's not that problem. That's a problem within this global world of of migration is that there are a lot of principles and commitments out there but are not being implemented. So how can we make sure that this global comp compact contributes to something that will be will be implemented on the ground, um, to something that's meaningful and worth it directly for migrants as well as for refugees and societies on the ground. So that's why we tried to get, put together this document. The other reason was also that we felt that despite all the consultations, there wasn't really a clear consensus vision vision arising yet from what governments want this compact to be. And because of that, we felt that there's, there might be quite a lot of room still for influencing what the zero draft will look like and what the compact will look like. And it's good to have at least a starting point of where we think um, the global compact could be heading to. Um, so if you look at the 10 Act document, you, 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 you'll see that it puts forward a set of 10 goals uh, called acts. Uh, and links these with certain targets um, 
as well as certain timelines. Um, now, maybe I want to draw out a couple of elements um, that uh, were put into the TANAC documents that might be a little, I wouldn't say controversial, but maybe different from what governments have been talking about. And one of the things is the title of the actual compact uh, and the way we've tried to frame and position the TEN Act document. So you will see that it speaks about a global compact on human mobility, human mobility and migration. And talking with many civil society on the ground ab about the realities that migrants and refugees are facing, we felt there's so many overlaps in terms of well, absolutely universal and fundamental human rights, obviously, but also when you look at safe movement of people, when you look at, look at labor rights, uh, decent working conditions, um, issues such as family reunification or the inclusion and integration or anti-discrimination, all of these issues pertain not only to migrants in whatever category, but also refugees. So this is why this 10 Act document takes a rather broad perspective on human mobility that includes both migrants and refugees. Um, so you can see on the screen a sort of the summary, summary version of the 10 acts. So these 10 acts range from safe pathways for human mobility to uh, making sure that certain protection issues are in place to providing for decent living conditions, education, um, all the way to, to return. Um, so one other thing I, uh, I'd like to draw out is basically what the 10 X document proposes is some sort of an SDG type of compact um, that has specific goals and targets, but also has a review mechanism, also has a sort of an implementation mechanism. And that's why Act 10 is completely dedicated to what, what is the governance, what is the implementation structure that we need for this, for this compact to make it worthwhile. Mm -hmm because we can end up with all kinds of beautiful commitments of governments, but if there's no way to track progress and to help with implementation, including having finance and funding for implementation, then what will it mean? So that's the meaning of the last act. Um, and then finally, just a little bit on timelines, what you will see if you look through the document, and it very much takes inspiration from the Child Rights Initiative, it does propose a couple of timelines where we where many of us that worked on the document felt that there's urgency, you would see that an act should be implemented either without delay or that it should be achieved by 2020. So if you go through it, for example, there's issues like uh, putting an end to the detention of children for immigration purposes or making sure that children have immediate access to education uh, in Act, act 6. Um, those cannot wait. So we didn't put a timeline saying, well, this should be achieved in 2025 or something. But then there's other acts that do take a little bit of a longer timeline. And this includes a proposal for four, and I won't mention all of them, but there are proposals for four follow-up processes that come out of the compact um, on certain issues where we felt that it was unlikely that states were going to come to a consensus in the next, what is it? Just eight months uh, and where we felt more work is needed to to draw out new principles and new guidelines um, so this is for example a follow-up process on regularization regularization and pathways out of irregular status and towards secure residency for migrants or a follow-up process for um, migrants protecting migrants who are not refugees but do find themselves in vulnerable situations um, and also one on what do we propose in terms of alternatives tips and cooperation uh, with regards to return and reintegration um, so i'll stop there um, it would be great if i could turn to um, icmc to maybe give us a little bit of an update on how the document has been distributed um, how many signatures have already been collected um, and what are the next steps with the document. Um, and perhaps it's good to mention that the document will be out in French and Spanish very, very soon. I hope in the course of this week, uh, but it will also be translated into Arabic and I believe Chinese as well. Uh, but maybe I can turn over to ICMC to give us a little bit of update on where the document has gone so far. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> and thanks for ping-ponging it back to us. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, just uh, on, on uh, following what Visa said there, um, indeed the 10 acts, uh, acts uh, sorry, now and how 10 acts for the Global Compact uh, will be translated uh, into, uh, well, it is being translated and uh, designed in French and Spanish as we speak and will be um, released later this week on our website and uh, on the, uh, the MADE database. Um, and also is being translated into Arabic, uh, Russian and Chinese uh, and will be available on the website also uh, very soon, but a little bit later than the French and Spanish. Um, with regards to sign on so far, um, give or take 100 organizations have signed on um, as a signatory to this um, global civil society advocacy statement and you are welcome to do the same. Uh, we can post the sign on or how to sign on to this, um, this advocacy document in the, the chat box now. Um, and you can also access a, a template for advocacy to your own governments if you'd like to use them as a um, as a combo in your own advocacy with your own advocacy tools. Um, but uh, I think the best thing now would be to open it uh, up to the floor. Um, if you have anything that you'd like to uh, ask or clarify, or if there are your own comments um, that you'd like to bring, uh, now is the time. Uh, so any anything on advocacy in the past months, any questions that you would have for uh, Sophie, Colin or Vies, either in the chat box or um, uh, you can unmute yourselves to ask the questions. Uh, so far I have seen one um, or indeed two questions from, I ah, know, sorry, Fernand and Fernando, is it the same? Yes, the same, uh, Fernand. Thanks, Fernand, for your questions. Um, it seems uh, appropriate to send uh, to, to uh, put the first one uh, to Colin. Um, on the uh, regional civil society consultation in Africa and I believe one or two of the uh, focal points uh, in Africa who, who organized that meeting uh, are also attending this call so they are very welcome uh, to also input uh, for that question. Um, but Colin would you like to take that one and uh, others I really welcome you to, um, to write questions or comments in the box or let us know if you'd like to um, ask a, a question directly to any of the speakers. So Colin thank you. Thanks, Imer. Yeah, thank you, Fernand, for your questions. I think, first of all, just to recognize what you said right at the start is really absolutely the, the, the key point that prompted us to try to organize these regional civil society consultations that for many, many people working on migration, working with migrants, of migrants themselves, working on the ground at the national, at the regional level, uh, had, had heard very little and engaged very little around the global compact. So it was really targeted for those kinds of groups and not specifically for uh, other international NGOs who are much more engaged in Geneva and New York as well, because uh, there were other opportunities for that, especially through the global processes. So yeah, these regional consultations were designed around that as well. Uh, but specifically uh, around the regional economic commissions. So there were four regional economic commissions. Uh, the first ECLAC for Latin America, uh, the second one, um, uh, the um, S, sorry, ESQA uh, for the Middle East, uh, and then uh, ECA, the Economic Commission for Africa, and then ESCAP, as I mentioned, just concluded uh, this today uh, their consultation. All these, these four regional economic commissions uh, had their own series of consultations and processes in coming up with uh, a report. So that's, I think, what you're referring to for now, not specifically a regional position paper, but a report on their consultation that, uh, that they are drafting. And, and the same thing has been undertaken specifically for Africa by the ECA in collaboration with the Africa Union, uh, and they are drafting that, that outcome. Uh, and all of these will be presented at the stock taking meeting coming up in early December uh, in Mexico. Just to mention a quick footnote to that as well, uh, the ECE, the, the Commission for Europe uh, is also engaging in a two-hour dialogue and, and position uh, or discussion and inputs and recommendations about the global compact uh, to come up. I, I forget what that date is, uh, but that's specifically to that. Um, and of course, specific to the regional civil society consultation in Africa, I turn over to Mamadou and Milka, and I believe Mamadou has already responded uh, to you about that. Thanks, Colin. Thanks a lot. And. Uh, Fernand, if you have any follow-ups, feel free to um, to write them in the chat box. Um, 
So uh, anybody like to uh, ask a question, um, feel free to unmute and uh, address any of the uh, presenters and please do introduce yourself and uh, give your affiliation as well. The floor is open. Hello. 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 <laughs> yes, this is Fernando. Hi. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Absolutely, Fernand. Yes, I have muted another um, uh, participant, but they can unmute themselves after you to to also um, to speak. But yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, wonderful. I think I'm um, joining the webinar, the um, uh, Migration and Development Civil Society Network webinar for the first time. Um, but I'm not. Um, uh just i'm not just coming uh, the first time on my on the field of migration i've been working on the field of migration for several years uh, i worked in uh in central africa on refugees uh, operations uh, i was in the Darfur operations i was also in um, in in drc uh, with the IP, idp operations so i have extended the uh, experience in terms of uh, uh, refugees and uh, migration uh, operations management. Um, I'm afraid, and I must say that I'm really afraid. Uh, I put those two questions because uh, I've been, um, I, I worked in the past two years on the Red Cross uh, um, Right of Migrant Project in Action. I was the focal point for that project based in Benin, and uh, we had a very, very uh, uh, interesting experience under the project, uh, and uh, uh, what I noticed, what I noticed uh, right from the beginning of this process, is that uh, some people, as Momodu mentioned, some people, government representatives and CSO representatives, are attending um, a lot of meetings at regional level and uh, also at international level. But it is very unfortunate that when they come back, when they return to their countries, uh, very little actions are taken to disseminate the conclusions and recommendations of those meetings, which is, uh, um, for me, a great loss. It is a great loss because uh, uh, can you imagine how oh, what uh, um, the international community is putting as effort to organize those uh, uh, meetings? And uh, the little we are expecting from people who attend those meetings is once they return back, uh, they should disseminate and let other civil society organizations uh, uh, which cannot attend those meetings at regional and international level to know what is really happening. It is not what we noticed. Um, Sorry, also, Fernand, if, if I yes. may just um, interrupt you there. I, I think that some of what you're saying you've already written in the chat box. And if you have anything additional to say, it would be great if you could keep it there just so that we can ask um, just some other exactly. people to speak before we move it over to the second section, yes. only because the time is so tight. I'm yeah. so sorry. But is no, it okay, okay if we... Thank you. I'm so okay. sorry. I just, I, I, just, I just want to add one thing. Uh, I went through the 10 acts uh, and I'm very uh, pleased to see the, the 10 acts mentioning governance, implementation and monitoring. Uh, I would so much like to see uh, side by side uh, also civil society um, commitment to monitor the process. I, I don't think any act is, is mentioning that the civil society will take uh, uh, strict actions uh, to monitor the process. We all know what happened at governance levels and that if the government, government representatives are not doing what they're supposed to do, I think that is why the civil society organizations are there. So I don't know if it is still possible uh, to reformulate or uh, to, in, to include uh, civil society monitoring implementation. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, thanks, Fernand. Yeah, great point. And I might couple that question that you have or a comment that you have along with Gemma Adaba, who has written a, a, into the chat box a, a question, I, I think also to me, um, what's uh, the rationale for the decade on huma, uh, human mobility? So, Vies, if I could ask you to maybe address uh, uh, Fernand's question on uh, monitoring as well as Gemma's. Thank you. Yes, fantastic, and, and both both really good questions. Um, so let me take Gemma's question first. Um, so the reason why why we include, included um, why it was suggested to include this launch of a decade that looks at human mobility, development, and human rights is is basically to keep the focus on um, what we were really afraid of for this global compact process is that there's going to be a lot of energy and attention 
in the coming months uh, in negotiating the right text and getting the right words into the compact. And then after 2018, basically nothing will happen on the ground. So because of that, um, there is this, this Act 10 that looks completely at, at, at governance and implementation. Um, but also we felt that, that to give it more profile and more attention, uh, and also to sign signal that this is not a one-off moment. It's really a process with a timeline with different goals. It's good to have that decade uh, on your mobility. Now, obviously, it's a little um, symbolic, um, and you, you might ask the question, what is really the purpose of all these UN decades that we've had over the, over the last uh, years? But it would, would, it's just an extra element to keep the attention and maybe a little bit the pressure on that that this is something that needs to be anchored on the global UN agenda and cannot disappear again. Now we finally get migration into a UN framework. Um, but I invite anyone who's been involved in writing the 10 acts or signed on to, it to, to add to that as well. And then to your question, Fernand, um, that is a that's a great suggestion. I mean, we won't it won't be able to to go into the document itself, and the document itself is really aimed and intended for advocacy towards governments. Um, but it is a really interesting thought to think of a way that, that civil society can create some sort of a shadow monitoring of the implementation of the compact. And obviously, this is happening in a lot of other fields and areas, uh, including around uh, the Human Rights Council. And we haven't had a similar model, except a little bit on the Migrant Workers Convention, on uh, states' commitments to migration. So I, I think it's just a really interesting uh, proposal and something that civil society uh, should organize around and should, should work for, um, if there is the energy and the capacity, and depending on what the compact really, really will look like uh, at the end. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Ima. Thanks. Thanks a million, Vies. Uh, and tricky questions, Hello. which is what we like. Um, I do see some fantastic questions Hello. coming through in the chat box, but if I may ask yeah. Vies to uh, maybe address them immediately into the chat box, um, so that we can move on to the next uh, section. Again, really apologizing for the um, the uh, lack of time, uh, but conscious that there's so much more to discuss. So if I could hand it over to uh, Colin. Um, so we're into the next steps section. And um, Colin will again uh, speak at this time on the, um, the government-led stock taking, um, which is on from the 4th to the 6th of December in Puerto Vallarta. Uh, so, Colin, if you can, in about five minutes, uh, just uh, give a quick summary of this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Imer. And um, just to try to help move it along really quickly, I'm just pasting again the, the web page for the stock taking uh, process in general, but also specifically for related documents towards the stock taking meeting. So as Imer mentions, uh, the December begins the stock taking phase, which would run from uh, December through February. Uh, at the end of that, we expect a zero draft of the Global Compact, which I think everybody's anxiously waiting for. So how do we get to that zero draft? Um, in the stock taking phase, we'll, it will be kicked off by this uh, stock taking meeting, a preparatory meeting of the United Nations. Uh, so General Assembly procedures apply, and this will take place from the 4th through the 6th of December, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, three days, uh, in Puerto Vallarta in, in Mexico. Uh, and those of you who participate in the GFMD in 2010 will remember uh, Puerto Vallarta very well and the International Conference Center where this will take place again. Um, in Vallarta, there will be a number of different things that will take into consideration, I think, and people might be particularly interested in the modalities for civil society interaction in this. So one thing is, as I mentioned, it is a general assembly sort of procedures that are in place. So it's, it's very different from GFMD where there's a lot of leeway and accessibility to different things. However, uh, it is an intergovernmental conference which has a space for stakeholders. So even unlike the GFMD, it is open to stake other stakeholders, including and especially civil society. Um, the, um, there is a magic number uh, for such a meeting to take place, and that's 999 bodies in the conference center at that time during the, the conference. And this includes everybody, including support staff on the ground, 
uh, wait staff and people doing registrations. Every single person has to be accounted for and that has to total no more than 999. So the call facilitators have worked towards that number and, and designated about, uh, they're expecting I think somewhere around 600 uh, delegates from, uh, from states, member states to participate. For stakeholders, they have dedicated 100 seats uh, to participate, 100 people to participate. And that's all stakeholders. So it's not just civil society, it's private sector, academia, parliamentarians, NHRIs, uh, and others. So um, I think we can expect somewhere around 60, 70 of those, of that 100 to be civil society. We will definitely make up the majority, but uh, you know that's, that's the process for that. To participate in the, um, uh, uh, to participate in the in the stock taking meeting, there is a registration. Uh, uh, I would actually call it an application form. Uh, I'm also pasting the link to that form right now in the chat box. So it, I would encourage uh, everybody who's interested to participate to look very carefully uh, at that form and and the procedures for application. And, and I would highlight sort of three things uh, to to consider. One you must have had either ECOSOC status or special accreditation. And, and people will remember the special accreditation process for this phase, uh, for the consultation and the stock taking phase, actually began uh, back in April and was closed by May. So if you do not have special accreditation, that's already on there. Um, if you're not sure if you have special accreditation or not, um, I will paste now also the link uh, which lists all the organizations that have special accreditation. So if you see your organization not, not listed there, most likely you do not have special accreditation, unless of course you have ECOSOC status. So if you have ECOSOC status or special accreditation, then you can apply. Anybody without that will not be able to apply at all, will be immediately uh, discarded and disqualified. If you have that and you apply only one person per organization, they're going to be very, very strict about that. And there are many questions about that, but unfortunately, they, they're expecting well, well over 100 uh, applications uh, to participate from stakeholders. So I think the SRSG's office will be very, very overwhelmed in trying to find, uh, even to limit it down to 100. So they're definitely very firm um, on saying that they, they are going to keep to one person per organization. So the question in Bex is if there are more than one person uh, applying for an organization, what happens then? They will probably revert back to you to say, come back with one name only. Uh, and most likely, uh, if they don't receive a, a timely response, they will just reject the application entirely. So I would really encourage you to plan for this and just have only one person applying for your organization with that ACOSOC status or that special accreditation. Uh, and the third thing is the deadline. The deadline is the 17th of November. Uh, there will be absolutely no extensions to the deadline, as you can imagine. That's just barely two weeks away from the, the, the stock taking meeting itself. So they have to turn around very quickly. They have assured us that, that and this is the SRG's office who is coordinating the operations for the stock taking meeting. They have assured us that as soon as the 17th itself, people will begin to be notified uh, in terms of their acceptance or rejection to participate in the stock taking meeting. So. I think for the most part, if people apply uh, and, and get it through on time and everything is set, you should have no problems getting accepted uh, if you apply. And I would encourage you to apply as early as possible uh, because if there's a determination about them not enough seats for that 100, uh, for you know more applications than the 100, then uh, most likely you know, they will look at regional balance, they will look at uh, um, you know, how late you apply, those kinds of things, and definitely try to get it in before that 17th deadline. And finally, just to mention also that, um, and I think this might be a good segue for you, back to you, Emer, it's, it's just in terms of the, um, the civil society stock taking meeting that we're also organizing on the second and third. Uh, for those participants, there will be a priority uh, given to that, but only if um, those participants meet the criteria uh, that are set forth, as I mentioned before. So I'll just pause there. I think most of the information is already on the website. You'll see that the, the, the agenda laid out in, in terms of the, the participation. Oh, just one more thing I should mention in terms of uh, interventions. So there, there is a panel, uh, panel two on the first morning, on the first afternoon, on day one. 
uh, which looks at stakeholder perspectives. We have a civil society seat and someone from civil society, a representative from civil society will be sort of uh, engaging in this Davos style discussion about, uh, you know, what came up in the consultation phase in terms of civil society. Um, interventions from the floor will be taken, but priority will be given to member states. And this will be very similar to the thematic sessions. Anybody who participated in thematic sessions may be very similar to that. Maybe uh, a, a very, very few, uh, I believe, uh, opportunities will be given to other stakeholders, and there will be need to be balanced out with other stakeholders, not just uh, civil society, uh, right at the end of the session, uh, depending on the moderator's uh, prerogative, but mostly it'll be state interventions and the plenary sessions. However, in the uh, breakout sessions on the second day onwards, uh, there'll be much, much more opportunities for uh, stakeholders to engage and participate and, and intervene. So we'd be much more on an equal footing with states and agencies and other stakeholders as well. So I know that was also another question that came up. So I'll pause then and turn it back to you, Ima. Well, thanks so much, Colin. There's a, a lot of information there and, and all of it very valuable. Um, one more uh, thing that I would request from you is that maybe uh, because this is quite a new process, uh, uh, an application process done through the Office of the uh, a representative, Special Representative um, for International Migration, it would be great if you could uh, maybe share the contact details um, in case of questions or inquiries from civil society so that they know um, how to uh, ask their questions and who to ask their questions to if they have any um, regarding uh, participation and application for this government-led uh, stock taking on the 4th to 6th. But now um, moving from the government-led one to the civil society uh, led uh, and organized one on the 2nd and 3rd of um, December, so immediately before the government one, I turn you over to Sophie Van Hazen who will uh, talk us through that a little bit more. Thanks Sophie. Yeah, thanks, Emer, for that introduction. So indeed, um, ICMC, together with the, the migration-focused groups in the Action Committee and really working also closely together with um, the regional um, coordinators of the regional civil society consultations that Colin uh, introduced a bit earlier, um, we've been looking at organizing a meeting. It will be a small, small meeting. We would have capacity of about 60 participants. Um, so the thinking behind it was that we would bring the processes that have invested in organizing towards the Global Compact together um, in that meeting um, through kind of nominations from these different networks and processes. Um, so actually we're just finalizing the list of people to be invited and on our website you can also find kind of the different processes and contact details for those um, for those uh, coordinators that uh, nominated people to be invited to this to this um, consultation. So maybe Fernando also to link back to what you said earlier on um, um, delegates being selected to participate in regional consultations or civil society organizations or, or global ones. Um, what we will try to do is also publish the list of, um, of participants who will actually be attending so that it is transparent for, for everyone who couldn't be there um, to then afterwards liaise back with, with these organizations that have been able to attend. So we'll try to put all of, all of that um, information on our website uh, as soon as possible. Um, so maybe just a, a, a little bit of background on how we're trying to shape the two days. So um, the first day we'll really look at the different acts in the 10 acts document and we'll break it into smaller groups um, to work on these different themes. But we'll at the same time we'll look at, um, we'll, we'll do a little bit of stock taking in these different thematic um, discussion groups. So we'll look back at what civil society has been doing, what we've formulated and come up with in terms of positioning. But at the same time, um, these groups will also look at, okay, what's next? What do we tell governments? Um, what do we want to do with this team and with these red lines that we've come up with in the negotiations phase? Um, on day two, we're planning to meet with governments. So um, we've invited about 44 governments um, to participate in smaller uh, thematic tables, thematic and regional tables um, in that second day. Um, timing has been relatively short for us to invite governments, so we hope that we will get <laughs> the responses that we need to um, to fill that day, but that is still uh, that is still pending. Um, maybe just a few words on outcomes of the of the civil society meeting. So as Colin already mentioned, it's not 
not necessarily clear who will be accepted to attend the, the government-led stock taking and we don't really know or we don't have a clear idea on um, who of the civil society meeting will be able to participate in, in the government stock taking. Um, but in any case, what we will do is we'll draft a report uh, coming out of the stock taking and that we'll share widely. Um, but then another idea could be to have another webinar as well, uh, maybe early 2017 to kind of link um, the results of the stock taking maybe even with the zero draft once once that is out um, so yeah i think that i i think i'll stop there and if there's more questions um i'll be happy to answer them yeah thanks, thanks sophie and I, i'll remind everyone just once more that you you feel free to um ask any questions or have any comments that you have um into the chat box or um hold your breath for the open floor which we'll have in a few moments um but before we do that i'd actually like to go back to sophie again and maybe just um ask her to uh talk a little bit more about beyond the stock taking so we have all of this coming up in december but what next what after that um, taking place in early next year? Um, is, is it a dead end and uh, we all uh, go into hibernation or is there something going on next year? So Sophie, if you could very quickly, three minutes on, on that, thanks. Yeah, and of course I don't have all of the answers, just a few maybe ideas. Um, so in February, the government, the co-facilitators will have the zero draft um, ready. So the zero draft, as Colin already said, will be the basis for the negotiations Phase. So once civil society has an eye on that zero draft, we can really start working on our advocacy, um, on advocacy based on that zero draft. Um, it also means that we will have to really start talking to governments uh, in capitals, um, but also governments at New York level where the negotiations will actually be taking place. Um, so a big question mark is um, how do we communicate with each other on um, on strategies, but maybe also what, what Fernando also mentioned on civil society, on the civil society role in um, perhaps monitoring um, this global compact once it is adopted, um, because we will get a sense of how ambitions, how ambitious governments will want to be once we see this zero draft. Um, so just to go back to how can we communicate to each other? So one of the ideas could be um, on the side of information sharing could be to have kind of regular webinars as we're doing right now um, throughout the negotiation phase. Of course, we have to look at capacity for that, but this could be um, one way. Then there are several groups that have already started compiling um, kind of matrices of governments that they specifically want to target on certain issues because some governments might have um, might be champion states on certain issues that we want to um, want to see in the global compact or some governments might actually need a lot of convincing because they tend to block certain um, certain um, negotiations so there's a few of these lists circulating um, so this could also be a way of, of trying to keep in touch with each other on um, on which governments who has talked to um, for example and how we can kind of um, come together on that and so as a follow-up we could also share um, the majors that we have from our end if that would be useful for you um, but yeah I think that's it in terms of um, a few ideas on that for next year um, but of course the floor is open and I think actually we in, in the next agenda item might be able to give a little bit of intel on uh, on how it went last year intel and advice <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, and thanks a million for that, Sophie, as well. Um, it's great to get that sense of continuity looking forward, but also looking back because, of course, we're not reinventing the wheel with all that we're doing uh, towards this global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration. We have been, uh, many of us on the call and, um, and in wider civil society have been so active towards the summit last year, which is where this global compact for safe, orderly migration, of course, came from. And VIS was very much at the front of all of the um, efforts uh, based in New York uh, last year. So I think it would be very valuable, Wies, if we could hear from you on any sense you got last year about um, like what lessons we could learn from um, the Action Committee advocacy towards that summit and uh, especially with that uh, sense that uh, Sophie gave about how we approach governments even. So please, um, we'd very much welcome your, your advice there. So if you have uh, three minutes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. Three minutes. Thanks, Eva. I, mean, I, I could talk Maybe about it for hours. 
Um, and, I, and there's others on the call that were very much involved in last year's uh, negotiation process that took place in New York uh, in a much more compressed time frame than, than, than it will be next year. And in that sense, things will be a little different, I think. So yeah, I can share a few lessons and they're really simplistic and maybe even a bit childish, but, but, I, <laughs> but it is what I took away from, from, from last year. Um, last year, being in New York, being in the back of the room while the negotiations were taking place. Um, so one thing is the discussions are taking place in New York, but that's not where the expertise is on migration or human rights. Um, so what we need is presence in the room in New York and contacts with missions in New York and contacts in capitals. Because if there's difficult decisions to be made, or if they're really sticky negotiation points, it's not the people in New York that make the decisions, but they take um, their advice and their speaking points from the capitals. So, so that is one piece of advice. If we can find a way as civil society to organize between some of us, some of you, that will be able to be in New York and dedicate resources to this by sitting in the room and having contacts with the missions and link that with many of your organizations that have contacts in capitals, then that can be a very effective uh, influencing strategy. Uh, and we did that several times last year when there were um, problematic issues or problematic pieces of text, um, in particular around um, having children in detention for immigration purposes. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, let's try to work together as much as we can. Um, civil society might not agree on every single uh, priority issue or every single text issue um, and might also have different tactics and influencing but collectively, we have much more knowledge than each of our individual organizations. Um, so if there is a system, and we had that last year, where we at least share information on when the new zero draft, when the new draft is out, which subgroups of, of states are meeting. So last year, there was a big organizing going around the Latin American groups. And we had a couple of civil society groups that were very uh, well connected to some of the Latin American countries. But I know there's similar groupings in the EU and Africa. So let's work together and share information there where we can. Um, and then maybe the last two, and I, as I say, I can speak about this for hours, maybe the last two sort of lessons learned from last year is um, let's be ready and let's be ready with different tactics. So with be ready, I mean that once the negotiations start and things need to be solved uh, because we think it's going in the wrong direction or there's wrong text in there, it's already quite late to then start building up contacts with governments. Um, so if we can already start, and, and we're starting that with the stock taking, and I know many of you are meeting nationally, if you already have the right contacts within the relevant ministries in your governments that you know are involved in negotiations, then that becomes very useful once there is an issue to be solved. Um, there's this Swiss government uh, delegate that, that often comes to our meeting that says, try to have a mobile phone number of the key government rep representatives in your phone saved. Um, so that, that's a useful advice. Um, and then be ready with, with different tactics. Um, it depends a little bit how much sort of diversions of co or convergence from among member states will be on the various drafts of the document and how much uh, civil society thinks it's going in a completely wrong direction or right direction. But from experience last year, um, we tried to have a variety of tactics from basically feeding in track changes and text into not necessarily the most powerful government, but any government we think was an ally on a certain issue and have them have a, an, an ideally one or two or three, having them read the same text that we wrote um, was a very useful way to get things on the agenda. And with those issues, it wouldn't even have to be attributed to, oh, this is a point that comes from civil society and it was actually stronger that it, that it appeared to come from three different governments at the same time. But then sometimes we need to be ready to call out governments publicly. Uh, and this is what happened last year when there was really a, a final stringent, difficult issue to solve uh, around this uh, article on um, 
allowing states in exceptional circumstances to have children uh, in detention or immigration purposes. And there was one particular government, um, and this was before their presidential elections, that wanted to have that there in a really awful um, awful language, um, which is when we decided that it was time to do a public letter with public signatures to that specific administration. So different, different tactics. Um, yeah, and maybe finally, again, we do not exactly know how the negotiation processes will go. And last year it was quite different because there was only a month, um, month of negotiation or maybe six weeks. Um, this time it will be much longer. Um, but I do think the experience is that whenever we're after like really structural changes, like big changes in the way the document is set up, that's likely more likely to fly in the beginning of the negotiation process than towards the end when it's really about wording and wordsmithing of certain articles. Um, but I'm definitely um, very interested what others who were also in New York last year or in different capitals would have to say about that. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Oh, thanks so much, Vies. I, I, I found that super interesting. So I, I hope everyone else did as well. Um, but let's uh, let's stop uh, talking with the presenters and, and let's uh, hand it over to the floor. Um, I, I hope that uh, some of you can offer your own um, uh, inputs or insights into your own work. Um, I hope that you have some questions maybe. Uh, or provocations for the presenters, um, and you're all very welcome to to speak. I'll, I'll at first um, ask those who have not already spoken to um, if, if they would like to make a comment or question. Please feel free to do so, or of course, always uh, the chat box is there as well. So uh, the floor is open, and um, yeah, take it away. Hi, Imran. Good morning. Uh, hello, yes. Uh, uh, mon ami? Uh, hello? Yeah. Hi, go ahead. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Suisse, for that recap, a really good recap of uh, how things played out in New York last year. Um, and I know there's various civil society networks really figuring out resources, which are limited, obviously, to half a person in New York. Um, so I look forward to working with um, Action Committee and, and those of us who will be here in New York um, next year. Um, one of the things I would add to, to the great summaries and sort of, um, sort of thinking about the diversity of tactics that we mentioned was that one of the things that was really important during those negotiations was not just to um, you know, it's like a daily sort of looking at the, the interventions from governments and then having sort of uh, our little sort of huddles and strategy meetings of those of us who are in the back of the room was important, but also disseminating that information out, particularly as we have been talking, as Colin's been mentioning and others are on the call from the regions, to make sure that that's not lost when the conversation comes to New York. Um, and we also obviously need to work closely with regional um, uh, sort of the organizing that's been built up in the, the conference and engage in work, advocacy, action in capitals as well. Information to the regionals, but a lot of what we did with the Global Coalition on Migration was also to feed back direct inputs, and, and it's a very, you know, this will be a, a bit of a longer process and more preparation. But to really get direction and insight from regions about how to feed particular language or positions for those of us who are sort of representing and, and being accountable to our, our regional bases um, in New York during that period. Thanks. Thanks, Monami Malik of uh, Global Coalition on Migration for that. Um, uh, others? Yeah, it's uh, John Bingham in Geneva. Just um, also to follow up on um, Wies and, and Monami talking about the um, role of civil society during negotiations. We've heard uh, again and again and again, and for a while we, we actually worried ourselves that you know, once the consultation is over, once the 
stock taking is finished. There's no role at all for civil society. Uh, the civil society is not involved in the negotiations. And that's just dead wrong. Uh, civil society has, has a, a, a clear role straight through the negotiation period. In fact, it, it, it's, it's the most important moment for civil society to talk with governments. And it's not just in the hallways of the meeting rooms of the UN in New York. It, it's very much in capitals. And, and again, to underscore, I think what Weiss was saying, you know, last year at the summit in New York, it was really sad when we heard from 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 governments uh, in in the processes uh, of the summit that oh we haven't heard anything back from civil society in our capitals. Um, so for all of us, uh, you know, ourselves included, um, that's the real challenge, um, and that's the real place for civil society to try and achieve its purposes, our purposes uh, towards this this compact during the during the negotiation process. Thanks, John. Uh, yes, uh, Gemma, uh, please. Yes, uh, just a question. I wanted to know exactly how you are planning with which governments you would plan to meet in Puerto Vallarta, because you suggest you said that that's something you are planning for the second day of the civil society base. Because it seems to me that would be a strategic moment to try to build up some contact with governments and who have come from capital, and then to use that opportunity for follow-up when once the real advocacy starts. So it would, it would be good to hear exactly how you are planning to do that. Those contacts with governments on the second day. You mentioned doing small roundtables or something like that. So if, if we could hear a bit more about that and how we can strategically plan to engage with governments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Gemma. I'm, you have a bit of background noise, so I'm just going to mute you now, if, if that's okay. But if you'd like to speak later, um, just unmute yourself. Um, I, I might close the, the floor for a second just to answer the, uh, the, 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 the questions that we've received both uh, uh, on the on the mics and also in the chat box. So, um, if I may uh, direct uh, your question, Gemma, to uh, uh, Sophie uh, Van Hazen, and uh, or or uh, yes, sorry, and um, also the question of Taya Ram on um, the emphasis now on building contacts um, in order to launch into the advocacy work during phase two, or uh, what value there might be also in continuing spaces. That were initiated during the regional consultations. So, uh, if I may uh, direct that one to, um, well, uh, actually any one of the three um, uh, speakers. Uh, we also got uh, in um, uh, in a in a chat just to the organisers um, a question asking um, or, or a comment uh, followed by a question. So um, they they say that the. Uh, uh, in, the re when, in the regional consultations, or one of them, uh, one of the speakers from a UN agency said that if civil society could come together on its key points for the global compact, uh, it would be harder for governments to ignore civil society. Um, and so the question is, uh, is that what you are hearing from governments? Um, and is, it that, uh, is that what you found with some of these collective civil society statements in other processes in recent years, uh, such as the summit that was referred to? And I might direct that one to uh, either Vis or, or, or Sophie to uh, respond to. So if um, maybe in a reverse order, so uh, Vis, would you like to take up that, uh, that third question? And then we'll get to the, the second followed by the first. Um, yes, um, yes, thanks, Imar. And I can also maybe briefly respond to, to Taya's question. Um, I mean, I can't really speak to what we've been hearing over the last weeks from governments because I have not been, to my great shame, be in touch with too many governments. But it's definitely our experience from last year that there where we managed to speak in some sort of a collective voice or at least had either a significant group of civil society on board on one specific statement or sometimes there was maybe a few civil society groups but ones that had very strong outreach in certain governments or capitals or or worldwide. Um, so the Action Committee has a couple of bigger civil society groups and then some more grassroots groups. Um, it was true that that um, 
governments and particularly the UN found it then harder to to um, to ignore the points and that's not to say that civil society was successful in every single priority that they put forward um, and there was actually quite a lot of disappointment in the end uh, with some of the outcomes of the summit uh, but at least the points were, were heard and came come, came across um, and it even came to the point that UNHCR really wanted to meet with organized civil society because UNHCR felt um, that they, this was sort of a, a force of power and they felt a little bit threatened uh, by some of the priorities that civil society was raising because it wasn't necessarily aligned with, with what UNHCR wanted last year. So that is just a lesson from last year. And on your question, Tala, on, on, um, on whether the, strategy, the focus should be on building up advocacy contact um, versus still having substantial conversations in the regions about um, certain issues, including root causes. Um, I feel that these things are really quite linked. So, so yes, I do think the time is now to build up those ad advocacy contacts towards the stock taking and then also after the stock taking so that, that those contacts are in place once the negotiations start. But obviously when you're having advocacy meetings or, or um, our contacts, there will be certain priorities that you will be drawing out uh, in those meetings. And the issue that you that you mentioned um, is one of the priorities that that's definitely going to come up in the negotiations and something that needs to be raised with governments. So it does make sense to continue the conversation also among uh, among civil society. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, Lise. I, I think you've uh, uh, ad, uh, yes answered both questions, but uh, Colin or Sophie, if you'd like to uh, flesh out the, the answer to Tala, feel free. But um, uh, I'll also hand over to Sophie for the question of Gemma on um, day two with, uh, with governments and, uh, and uh, approaching governments uh, for civil society advocacy. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Gemma. And actually, we've we've established this um, this surround sound matrix, is what we call it, with uh, about 44 governments in there. And that list of governments is the result of a few of the movements coming together. For example, also the Child Rights Initiative um, did like the first step for that, and we've built onto that list um, together with with uh, some of the global processes. So it's 44 um, governments that we want to specifically target because they've been um, champions on some issues that we, we work on. But of course, it's very hard to identify who in the government we need to target. And I think uh, Claudia also refers to that in the chat box. Like, even if, if we want to invite, for example, um, the, the Dutch government, what ministry, ministry should it be directed to? Who, who of that ministry is going to attend um, the UN stock taking? Because of course, if we want to sit with, uh, with those people um, the day before the UN stock taking, we need to we need to find out who that person will be. So there's a lot of question marks, and I think uh, working together on that could um, could only help us. So um, we we've reached out to to all of these governments and to the contacts that we have within these governments. Um, but in parallel, um, some of our um, our partners and networks have also reached out to the same governments, but perhaps different ministries. So it's true that we might not be very um, successful in directly targeting the right person um, in the right ministry, but at least we're, we're um, trying to contact them through different angles. Um, because of the time pressure, this is really uh, the only way we've we've seen this feasible. Um, but what we can do as, um, as a follow-up is share that list of governments with you and also um, share who we've contacted and within which ministry. Um, also responding to your question, Solange, uh, on who from the French government. So we'll, we'll try to get that information to you. Um, thanks also for suggesting that, by the way. Great. Thanks, Sophie and Vis and Colin, who is very active in the chat box for all of your uh, um, all of your answers there and responses. Um, uh, before we go, uh, maybe we can just uh, give one quick uh, point about um, the Louise Arbor, who is holding a dialogue next week with civil society. Uh, maybe Colin, um, if you'd like to uh, say one quick word on that, and then I'll hand it over to Sophie to conclude. But Colin, please first. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, I think this is a very good follow-up uh, next week itself. Uh, and before saying that, the, the end of the stock-taking phase in, in February 
uh, Luis Albert of SRSG will come up with a, a report from the Secretary General towards uh, the Global Compact. And, and so this, I think, is also very highly anticipated and, and weighted by many people. Um, <clears throat> and, and her office has asked that we organize uh, two dialogues, one a local one in New York that will take place next week on Tuesday the 14th. Uh, from 10 to 11.30 a.m. at the Church Center for the United Nations, CCUN, uh, 777 United Nations Plaza. I think everybody knows that it's it's uh, the uh, boss room. Uh, for those who in New York also probably familiar with that. Uh, to participate in that, I'll, I'll just send you the link right now on the chat box as well. Um, to participate in that, as, uh, you can also attend that if you are not in New York. and. But if you plan to participate, do send your RSVP to me as soon as possible. Uh, we'll, we'll pass that on to um, the um, uh, SRSG's office. Um, so that's on the 14th. Um, and then on the 15th, for those, I think most people who are outside of New York, on the 15th and uh, next Wednesday, there will be a webinar also from 10 to 11 o'clock in New York time. Um, and I'll also post that link on the, um, on the chat box in a second. Uh, and that way you can also interact and dialogue with uh, Louise about uh, her report that's coming out and any kind of key points you'd like to see raised within the global context. So I think it's a very important way to engage the SRSG in, in what she's coming up in her report for stop taking as well. Thanks, Ina. Thanks. Thanks a million, Colin. And great if we could have the uh, that info as well. Um, but now, Sophie, if you'd like to say any last few words before we close up. Yeah, thanks a lot, Emer. Um, maybe just a few kind of practical follow-ups that we'll uh, that we'll try to do after this call. Um, so we'll share uh, some of the details that we've shared in the chat box um, in in one email, so that you have, so that you have all of the information um, kind of grouped together. Uh, specifically, the webinar that Colin just mentioned um, will include the matrix with the governments um, and. We also hope to um, to plan in a webinar early next year, um, right after the stock taking, but um, when we have the zero draft um, document out there, so that we can really um, start preparing for the negotiation phase. Um, yeah, maybe just a, a request. Feel free to share the 10 acts widely. Um, so this week, as was mentioned before, we'll have the additional languages um, available, at least French and Spanish. And next week, we'll have Russian, Arab, and Chinese. So great if you could spread that wildly. I think it would be a great sign um, going into the stock taking conference to have this document with a with a, a, a solid list of signatures. Um, yeah, and I think that's it so far. Ah, there was some something else that I wanted to mention. Um, unfortunately, our colleagues from the NGO Committee on Migration in New York couldn't attend um, this webinar, but we did want to share a very specific um, action that they are conducting towards the stock taking um, towards the stock taking conference. And they're actually um, launching a survey on. Um, on tackling on the together campaign and looking specifically at the xenophobia um, so um, if you don't mind we'll also share that link um, in the chat box and in an email later to you so it would also be great if you could if you're interested if you could fill that in um, so that being said yeah I just want to thank everyone for joining and for bearing with us in this um, incredibly fast um, webinar. Um, so we'll keep you updated on um, on the global activities and um, on whether we'll be organizing a new webinar soon. So thank you all for joining. Thanks, Sophie. In fact, I think the pace of this webinar has mirrored perfectly the whole process. Whole process. So <laughs> this is a, a good example of what this whole last year and probably next year would be like. Um, so thank you all so much for your comments, your questions. Um, all of your inputs. Um, I think it was a great uh, webinar with lots of interaction and um, lots of food for thought as well. Um, so let's leave it there and take it over to email now if you have any follow-ups. Uh, we definitely do, we'll, as Sophie said, we'll be in touch with you uh, with them, but uh, keep in touch and uh, let's, uh, let's try and uh, keep this momentum going into next year. So thank you all so much for joining. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry, I should say thank you so much also to our three wonderful presenters, um, Sophie Van Hazen, Vismas and Colin Raja. Of course, thank you so much for, for all of your information and presentations.